Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, tonight I'm continuing in the study of the book of John. Uh, if you have not seen the previous studies on John, I, I hope you will go back and watch this from the beginning. Uh, those videos are uploaded on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. Uh, but tonight I'm going to pick up where I left off last time, uh, John chapter 5, verse 25, I believe. Yes, 525. Now, I'm a KJV firstist, so I will read it first in the KJV, and then I'll also look at it in the amplified version because it amplifies it, and sometimes it's helpful to uh, have it amplified and shed a little more light on it. So let me begin. Uh, John chapter 5, verse 25, KJV says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son of, to the Son to have life in himself, and hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Well, um, I, I could go on, but let me stop right there for a moment and and uh, consider what that's really all about. Um, it says the the hour is coming, or the the time is coming, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God. Now, of course, we know the Son of God is Jesus Christ, and the dead are going to hear His voice. Now. If you've watched my videos, you've been following me for a while, uh, you're probably very knowledgeable about this already, but I'm going to assume some people are not aware of this. And that is that um, the scriptures in, and Jesus himself promises us of a resurrection of all the people who have ever lived. Uh, there will be a bodily resurrection. Now, when Jesus was crucified, he died on the cross and paid for all of our sins, and he was buried in a tomb for three days, and then he raised himself from the dead, and he walked uh, on the earth again for 40 days among 500 witnesses. They saw him, they talked with him, they ate with him, they talked with him, and it was a bodily resurrection. Uh, Thomas heard about it and he didn't believe it. So he said, I won't believe he's raised from the dead unless I see him with my eyes and I touch him and put my fingers in his wounds. Then Jesus appeared to Thomas and, and said, come, touch me, put your fingers in my wounds. And Thomas did and he said, God as he said, my Lord and my God. And uh, so th these are proofs that there was a bodily resurrection of Jesus. Jesus promised that he would raise himself from the dead to give us a sign as proof that he is God and that he is the Savior and that he does have power over life and death. He raised himself from the dead and he promised that he's going to raise you from the dead and me. If I died right now, there come a time when Jesus will call on all the dead to come back to life. The, the, it says the just and the unjust. The just are those people who are justified because they put their faith in Jesus. The unjust are all those people who are not justified because they never believed in Jesus. Uh, they will be found lacking and they are condemned. But that's what Jesus is talking about in this at this point in chapter 5. He's talking about this future resurrection that he's promised. Now, it could come... Uh, any time, I think, um, but we've been waiting for about 2,000 years now, so it could be a ways off or it could be very, very soon. But there, he does promise that he, just as he was raised from the dead, he will, we will be raised from the dead bodily. Now, so let me read that in the Amplified and see how it phrases it. Uh, it says, um, I assure you and most solemnly say to you, a time is coming and is here now when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God. That's Jesus Christ. 
and those who hear it will live. For just as the Father has life in himself and is self-existent, even so he has given the Son to have life in himself and be self-existent. How far did I go? Uh, verse 27, and he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the son of man. Uh, sinless humanity qualifying him to sit in judgment over mankind. So that's the, uh, when he's talking about the dead will come to life, it's talking about the resurrection. If you're already well studied in the scriptures, you're probably aware of this promised resurrection. Uh, if you're uh, not educated in the Bible, or, or if you're a, a typical Roman Catholic, you're probably totally aware about the future resurrection. Um, let me go on. In the KJV, verse 28 says, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Now, this verse here could be uh, misused, um, um, misinterpreted very easily by those people who believe that our future uh, uh, in, in heaven or in hell is determined by uh, our our personal merit by how good we are as a person, how religious we've been. Uh, but when he, the, the thing that he's talking about, and you'll learn this more as we go along, but if you want to do good, you put your faith in Jesus. That's the one good thing that you can do so that you'll be justified. And if you, if you don't do that, then you, you've done, you haven't done good. And so you won't have this promise of uh, uh, everlasting life in heaven. Let me see what it says in uh, the 28 in the Amplified. It says, do not be surprised at this, for a time is coming when all those who are in the tombs will hear his voice, and they will come out. Those who did good things will come out to a resurrection of new life. Those who did evil things will come out to a resurrection of judgment, that is, to be sentenced. Okay, the way it phrases it there, it's even more of a problem for uh, those of us who believe that salvation is determined by uh, faith in Jesus or no faith in Jesus. If you have faith in Jesus, we're promised life everlasting in heaven. If you do not have faith in Jesus, then your, your future is condemnation, the second death in the lake of fire. But the way it's phrased in the Amplified there is if you're doing enough good things that you're going to, uh, salvation is based on that, but it's not. Um, there's another verse that says if you must do the will of the Father to get saved. And so people think that, well, you got to do what God wants you to do and live a good life and be religious. But when we look further, we find out that the will of the Father is to believe on the Son. If we believe on the Son of God for salvation, we've done the will of the Father. If we put our faith in Jesus, we've done good, and we are justified. So let me go on. Uh, the KJV says, um, I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. Now, I've been doing a lot of studying and, and teaching on uh, uh, church history and uh, the um, Christian creeds and all the and the church councils, the ecumenical councils, and and it's it's um, one of the questions that in the second, third, fourth centuries that was debated is Christology and uh, the triunity or God, the Trinity. The word Trinity didn't, wasn't invented till later, but the concept was debated about who is Jesus? Is he a man? Is he God? Is he eternal? Did he have a beginning? 
uh, and then and what's the relationship between the son and the father and then they also brought in the subject of the same questions about this the holy spirit and so you had you had uh, theologians for a couple hundred years uh trying to figure that out writing about it and, and debating it and having councils where church leaders from around the world would come together and they would try to settle that question and they wrote creeds and the creeds one of the questions in the creed though is uh is the son subordinate to the father and and, and they also argued that would that mean that he's less than the father he's not as much god god is the father is more god than the son he's but the, not only does the scripture tell us but the conclusion of these councils and uh, and also this was expressed in these creeds is that no uh, jesus is equally god as the father they're equally god and jesus is not a creature he did not have a beginning he is eternal just as the father is eternal but this question here in this verse and a question that's been discussed quite a bit over the centuries is what is their relationship in terms of role uh, and the, the scriptures tell us that the, the son intentionally set aside some of his um, ability and authority so, so that he could uh, be subject to the father and so it was a willful thing a willing thing that the son did that jesus christ did and this is a reference to to that it says i can of mine own self do nothing so so he he became a man and and uh, by becoming a man he set aside uh, some things that he would do like omniscience he as a man he didn't know everything like the question was um when will the end come well jesus says no man knows not even the son only the father knows so uh he had as a, the son of god and the son of man he was still at this point was relying on the father he had become a subject or in his role was to be the son and to serve the father and he says i can of my own self do nothing um now let me read that verse 30 in the amplify it says i can do nothing on my own initiative or authority just as i hear i judge and my judgment is fair uh, righteous unbiased because i do not seek my own will but only the will of him who sent me so um not only do we see this expressed in the scriptures but we also uh see that uh as we study church history these are the kinds of questions that were discussed the theologians the church fathers and generations that followed them uh, they were studying the scriptures trying to figure out this relationship between we we have only one god and yet the scriptures say the father's god the son's god the holy spirit's god how do you explain that and as i said over several centuries they various theologians took various positions and the positions varied and they had to have these councils to discuss it and come up with an agreed position that they called orthodox, which is like the majority of the consensus. And one of the things, of course, is what we're seeing here in this verse, that the, their soul, the son, uh, had, takes on a subordinate role to the father. Um, okay, so in the KJV, verse uh, 31 says, uh, if I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. Uh, there is another that beareth witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesseth of me is true. Ye sent unto John, and he bear witness unto the truth. But I receive not testimony from man, but these things I say that ye may, might be saved. He was a burning and a shining light, and ye were willing for a season to rejoice in his light. But I have greater witness than that of John, for the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do bear witness of me that the Father hath sent me. There's a lot there. Um, of course, in the beginning, it's really talking about, the, he says, if I just make these claims to myself, 
if I bear witness of myself, it's not going to impress you. You're not going to be convinced. And there was someone who did bear witness of me, John the Baptist, but you wouldn't listen to him. Uh, but uh, I'm going to present another witness to you, and that is the works that I'm going to do. The miracles I'll perform will be a witness or a testimony or a sign or a proof that I am who I claim to be, God and Savior. So let me see how that's expressed in the Amplified. Uh, verse 31. Uh, if I alone testify about myself, my testimony is not valid. There is another, my father, who testifies about me. And I know without any doubt that his testimony on my behalf is true and valid. Well, the father testified about Jesus throughout the Old Testament. Uh, all the things in the Old Testament that were told about the coming Messiah, the Christ, the Savior, the Son of God, all those things were the Father's testimony about the Son that would come. Uh, so the Father has testified, and Jesus uh, told them, he says, if you, uh, you uh, earlier in this chapter, I think it, it was stated that uh, uh, it, you would believe in me if you, if you believe Moses, because Moses wrote about me. Uh, and, you have sent a, an inquiry to John the Baptist, and he has testified as an eyewitness to the truth. How was he an eyewitness? Well, uh, God told John the Baptist that um, when the, the Messiah comes, you'll see the, the Holy Spirit um, descend upon him uh, like a dove. And then John told, uh, recounted that and said, yes, when I saw Jesus and I baptized him, that's when I got that sign. That was proof that he is the one that was sent. So he, uh, John the Baptist was an eyewitness in that way. But the testimony I receive is not from man, a merely human witness. But I say these things so that you may be saved, that is, have eternal life. John was the lamp that kept on burning and shining to show you the way, and you were willing for a while to rejoice in his light. But, test, but the testimony which I have is far greater than the testimony of John. For the works that the Father has given me to finish, the very same works, that is, the miracles and proofs of my deity that I am now doing testify about me by providing evidence that the Father has sent me. That's beautiful. That's uh, that's really uh, uh, it's clear in the KJV, but in the Amplified, of course, it's uh, it's amplified, so it's even more evident uh, that that's what it's it's talking about. Um, The miracles that he did, right? well, uh, as we go continue on in the book of John, and if you read all the, the gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, you will, all, all the miraculous things that Jesus did are uh, retold there in those gospel accounts. And there's many of them. Uh, we know the first miracle, of course, was he was born of a virgin. Uh, and then, of course, he turned water into wine at the wedding. He healed the, the, uh, uh, at the, at the uh, pool of Bethesda. He, he healed the sick man. I can't remember what his sickness was, but he healed him. Uh, he will heal the blind. He will hear the deaf. He will cast out demons. Uh, he will feed 5,000. With, with a few loaves and fishes. He will feed 7,000 with a few loaves and fishes. He will walk on water. He will calm the storm. He will do all these things. And he, he's not doing these things simply because people are hungry. He wants to give them food. People are sick. And he wants to heal them. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that he's happy to help people. But these things are the signs and are, are the proof that when he claims that he is uh, equal to God, the Father, and that's why the Jews said they were going to stone him, because you, who are just a man, 
say God is your own father, making yourself equal to God. So the Jews understood him very clearly that he was claiming that he is God Almighty. And uh, so if he is God Almighty, then then it's a valid claim. But if he's not, and, and he yet claims that he's God, then that is blasphemy. And the Jews decide that it's blasphemy. But they ignored the miracles. The miracles were there to prove his claim. Say, look, this is what I'm claiming. I'm God. Now let me watch these miracles that I'm doing. It'll prove it. The ultimate miracle that he said would be a sign was when he, uh, the very first chapter of John, uh, they demanded, the Jews demanded a sign from him. He said, destroy this temple. And in three days, I will raise it up. And they said, are you crazy? It took 40 years to build a temple. You can, you're saying you destroy the temple, you can rebuild it in three days? But of course, it, it says that he wasn't referring to the temple in Jerusalem. He was talking about the temple of his body. When his body would be killed and die and he'd be in the tomb, he would raise it up on the third day, the resurrection. And so that's the sign that he said he would give them. And then later on, I think in John, we'll hear this. I believe it's in the Gospel of John. Uh, the Jews are going to demand a sign near the end of his ministry. After he's done all these miracles, they're still demanding a sign because the Jews seek after a sign. He gives them all the signs. But then finally, he says, well, the only sign I'm going to give you is the sign of Jonah. Just as Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights. So shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. Again, the scripture says he was using that as a, a, a analogous to his death, burial, and resurrection. And I believe that Jonah died in the whale. I think some people think that he was swallowed by the whale and he lived. He came out of the whale after three days. But when people get swallowed by a whale, they don't live. And again, if it's going to be analogous to Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, he died, he was put in a tomb, after three days he came back to life. Uh, Jonah uh, died, he was buried in the whales, inside the whale, and then after three days he came to life. So I believe Jonah was died in the, in the whale. Uh, but Jesus said that's the sign that he would give them, and that's the ultimate sign and when he raised himself from the dead, that's what convinced the apostles to um, um, to that it there was no way around it. He is God. He is Savior, and uh, they would no longer hide and cower from the Romans or from the Sanhedrin, the religious Pharisee Jews. That they, after Jesus was arrested and killed, they were all hiding out for their lives. After he was raised from the dead, they, they were no longer cowards. They were brave because they knew that Jesus proved to them he is God. And even if they, they were going to suffer as martyrs, and in fact, um, G Judas uh, hung himself. But the other 11, 10 of the 11, all suffered martyrs' deaths. Only John did not die a martyr's death, but he did was a martyr in the sense that he was imprisoned. So they all suffered or died for their faith. And if if they they would not have been willing to be sawed in half and, and and crucified and killed in various horrible ways, if they uh, they didn't believe that there was a resurrection. They knew there was a resurrection. They were eyewitnesses. They touched him. They ate with him. Therefore, because they knew it was true, uh, they were willing to die for that truth. If it was a lie that they were just making up, oh, Jesus was raised from the dead and they're lying about it, they wouldn't be willing to die for, over a lie, something new it wasn't even true. So this resurrection is, one of the, is the greatest uh, sign uh, that's the sign Jesus uh, promised, and it's the sign that gives all of us confidence that our faith in Jesus is justified. Uh, okay, let me go on here. Um, 
this is, uh, let me see. Verse 37, KJV. And the Father himself, which hath sent me, hath borne witness of me. Ye have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his shape. No one has seen the Father. Uh, even Moses was told to look the other way because he, he, he could not look at God and live, at least the Father. Uh, we can, of course, they were able to see the Son and live, but it says here, ye have neither heard his voice any time nor seen his shape. Uh, verse 38, and ye have not his word abiding in you, for whom he hath sent, him ye believe not. He says, your word is, and the, the word of God is not abiding in you because you don't believe in me, his son. Uh, let me read 37, 38 in the Amplified. It says, and the father who sent me has himself testified about me. You have never heard his voice nor seen his form, his majesty and greatness, what he is like. You do not have his words or scriptures abiding in you actually living in your hearts and minds because you do not believe in him whom he has sent. You do not believe in Jesus, the son of God. That's who God sent. Okay. Now back to the KJV. Jesus says, search the scriptures for in them ye think ye have eternal life and they are they which testify of me. <laughs> oh boy, uh, I have a I have a playlist titled uh, 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 "Prophecies in the Scriptures," and and the the Old Testament is just. Not only prophecies, but the pictures and shadows. I have another play that's called uh, "The Bloody Trail," and it it shows from Genesis all the way through the whole Bible, the uh, the what are called sh shadows or foreshadowing or pictures of of Jesus and his death for our sins, and uh, there's a lot of them, and it's really fascinating to see these things, these. These shadows and foreshadowing and pictures of uh, Jesus and this uh, de death on the cross for our sins. And then also the prophecies of th throughout the Bible. There's over 300 prophecies about Jesus in the, the, who would come and, and they've all been fulfilled. And I, so if you watch my playlist prophecies in the Bible, I think you'll see that that's a nut more proof that the Bible is true, that Jesus is who he claimed to be. But Jesus points this out here in this verse. He says, the scriptures are all written about me. I mean, the scriptures that they had at that time was called the law and the prophets. Uh, the law, uh, I think it's the first five books is law. And then after that, the other books are written by various prophets, but uh, that's the Old Testament books. All the Old Testament books, Jesus says, they were all written telling you about me. And that's what it says here in this verse. Uh, it says, uh, search the scriptures. He's saying, read the, the law and the prophets. Read the writings of the prophets. Read the Bible. They didn't have a Bible as we have it now, but they had the 39 books that we have in the Old Testament. They were all available. They all studied them. He said, search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life. So you, you study the scriptures because you want to find out how to have eternal life. And it says, and they are they which testify of me. So all the foreshadows and pictures of this Messiah, the Savior to come, are about Jesus. All of the prophecies are about Jesus. And Jesus uses this here. earlier in this same chapter. He said the same kind of a thing. He says, you say you believe in Moses, but you don't. If you read Moses, you'll see that he was writing about me. These are great claims that he's making. And, uh, and he performed miracles to prove his claims were true. Uh, let me read verse 39 in the, 
in the uh, Amplified. You search and keep on searching and examining the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and yet it is those very scriptures that testify about me. <laughs> uh, it's interesting that he also said this same thing. After his resurrection, uh, he was walking down a road to Emmaus. Uh, and that's what the scriptures refers to at the road to Emmaus. Uh, he's walking down there and he encounters two people and there, there's this fascinating conversation and uh, they are, the, the, the two people are dejected and Jesus, why are you upset? And they say, well, have you heard? Where have you been? Have you heard that we thought the Messiah came? But no, he's, he, he, he was killed. And then he revealed to them who he was no, no. First, he said he went through all the scriptures. Just as he's saying here to these people, go through the scriptures and you'll see it's all about me. So what he did was he started from the beginning of the scriptures and talked about all the pictures and the shadows and the prophecies about the Messiah. And he said, that was about the Savior. That's me. And then he revealed himself to them so that they saw it is Jesus. Uh, the Apostle Paul always did the same thing. Uh, he said, scriptures say that he had a custom that every time he came into a new town, the first thing he always did, even though he had a title, the apostle to the Gentiles, he always went to, to the, the synagogue. The first thing in every town, he went to the synagogue and he would present the gospel to the Jewish people. And he'd go through the scriptures and say, all these things were written about Jesus. He's the Messiah. He came. So... Um, Jesus and Paul uh, and 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 we all of us today uh, we should be using the scriptures to show that Jesus is the fulfillment of those prophecies um, let me read this in uh, oops uh, back in the KJV uh, it says, and ye will not come to me that ye might have life. I receive not honor from men, but I know you that ye have not the love of God in you. I am come in my Father's name, and ye receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him ye will receive. How can ye believe which receive honor one of another? and seek not the honor that cometh from God only. Uh, let's read those in the Amplified. Verse 40, starting with verse 40, it says, uh, he says, and still you are unwilling to come to me so that you may have life. I do not receive glory and approval from men, but I know you and recognize that you do not have the love of God in yourselves. I have come in my Father's name and with his power, and you do not receive me because your minds are closed. But if, it, but if another comes in his own name and with no authority or power except his own, you will receive him and give your approval to an imposter. Well, why does he say that? Well, uh, because it's true. They're, they did... Uh, uh, they did... Uh, uh, except a lot of uh, people who, who came before Jesus and after Jesus, they would, uh, uh, history history shows that many people came claiming to be the Messiah, and some of them got a following. Some people began to follow them. Um, and I think that's probably true. This, this prediction here, this statement, probably spans the centuries, the, the millennia, because even today, some people are coming, claiming that they are Jesus, that they're the Christ. I mean, if you were to Google the question, is the Christ here now, you'll probably find at least several popular people around the world that say they are the Christ right now. And some people are buying it. Um. Verse 44, how can you believe which receive honor one of another 
and seek not the honor that cometh from God only. Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuseth you, even Moses, in whom ye trust. For had ye believed Moses, ye would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if ye believe not his writings, how shall ye believe my words? So here's what I was referencing earlier, that uh, he's saying the scriptures. He said back here that, uh, the script search the scriptures for in them you think ye have eternal life and they are they which testify of me and the scriptures he's referring to or he's talking about Moses the writings of Moses uh, and it says uh, do not think I will accuse you to the father there is one that accuses you even Moses say, Moses is saying what's wrong with you people don't you understand in the in the writings that God gave me and I wrote it down and you, you've read it and, and yet are you so blind? Are you so stupid or so stubborn that you cannot see that this is the one that God's promised? This is the son of God, the Messiah. That's what Jesus is telling them. He says, if you just believe the scriptures, if you believe Moses, you'd know that I am the Messiah. I'll read this last few verses in the Amplified. Do not think that I am the one who will accuse you before the Father. There already is one who accuses you, Moses, the very one in whom you have placed your hope for salvation. For if you believed and relied on the scriptures written by Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me personally. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Okay. Well, I, I think because I'm here by myself tonight, I think that's enough uh, content for one night. Uh, at the end of the chapter five, I'll, uh, I'll leave it at that. Uh, but bef before I close, though, I, I, it's my custom to end every broadcast with a gospel message. And I want to tell you the good news. Now, that's what the word gospel means. It's a Greek word. It simply translates to good news. A lot of people use the word gospel inappropriately and very, to mean varying things, but it te technically and literally, it just means good news. And what is the good news? The good news is that Jesus is offering salvation and eternal life in heaven to everyone. That includes you. He offers salvation and eternal life in heaven to everyone as a free gift. <laughs> well, now, I'm going to give you a little more detail explaining uh, the details on that. But if you understand how profound that is, and if you believe it, if you believe that heaven eternal life in heaven is offered you as a free gift from Jesus, you should be jumping for joy right now. That's why it's called gospel, good news. I think that if there's a word that means great news, it should be, that's what it should be called. It's the greatest news ever. So let's start off with that. That's what the gospel is. It's the, the good news that salvation is offered as a free gift from Jesus. But the world as a whole today, and all, all, almost all the people who've ever lived in the history of the world, uh, they, they don't understand this, that salvation is a free gift. Um, and that's because the devil has deceived the world. Um, it started in the garden with the, the, the two trees, the, the, the tree of life. And, and the tree of life is a picture of Jesus Christ. You know, Jesus is the giver of life, and he died on a tree. He was crucified. The tree of life is a, a, a picture of, hey, if you just rely on God, you'll have life everlasting. But there's another tree over there. If that's not good enough for you, you can go your own way. And that's what Adam and Eve did. They decided to go their own way. They are persuaded by Satan that God lied. And he said, uh, Satan said, no, no, 
God told you that if you eat from the knowledge, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that you'll die that day. But that's not true. What will happen is you'll understand good and evil. And you'll have knowledge of right and wrong. And you'll be like God. So they didn't believe God. That was the, that was the original sin. They believed Satan instead of God. It was the sin of unbelief. And that's, that's the sin that everybody suffers from today. The, the, the only sin that will send you to hell. Not believing this message. But Adam and Eve did not believe God. They chose to believe the devil. And so they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And they... Uh, and that caused the fall of man. Uh, but ever since then, people throughout history and almost all people in the world today have believed in the knowledge of good and evil. And the, if man just understands what good and evil is, if we have laws and commandments to follow, it's telling us what's right and wrong. And if we're obedient and follow them, then that's the way that we get to heaven through personal merit. All the religions of the world are simply based on personal merit. That's why there's not really a difference between any of the religions. It's just a base systems of rules to follow. Uh, religion is a, uh, a system of rules you must follow in a hope that you're good enough and you please God and he accepts you into heaven. That's religion. And that's why Christianity is not a religion. Christianity is a relationship with Christ as your savior, where you're relying entirely on Christ. Now, Christianity, as you find in most churches in America and most places around the world, it's very religious. If you ask most Christians, do you think you're gonna to go to heaven? And if so, why? Uh, they're gonna plead their case on personal merit. Most of them will say, well, I hope I go to heaven. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to follow the Ten Commandments and the Golden Rule, and I attend church, and I do this, I do, 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 do. They think salvation is based on how well they do. But salvation is based on what Jesus did. It, instead of pleading that, oh, I, I, I hope I'm going to try to do enough, say, no, it's done. Jesus did it for me. He died on the cross and paid for my sins. And he raised himself the, uh, from the dead proving he has power over life and death. So what you need to understand is that going to heaven through personal merit is uh, doomed to failure. Now, the Bible says that uh, uh, all have sinned to come short of the glory of God. It's that every person sins. Now, I know that some people sin more than others. And, and uh, but it, it's, it's not the quantity of sin. If you sin one time or 10 times or a million times, you're a sinner. You can't go to heaven unless you're perfect. That's the standard. You must understand the standard is perfection. <laughs> the standard is not relative goodness. Well, I'm better than my neighbor. Maybe I'll get into heaven because I'm not as bad as him. I'm, I'm better than most people. So maybe God will accept me. Well, no, it's not relative goodness. It's perfection. So all have sinned. The Bible says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So the first thing you need to understand is that you are indeed a sinner and therefore you're disqualified. You can't get into heaven. You can strive. You can join all the religions of the world. You become very religious. And as you strive, you always fall short of perfection. And that's why when they... When Jesus was explaining to this, his apostles, they said, well, if this is the case, how is it possible for anyone to be saved? And Jesus said, with man, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. So salvation is possible with God. If you rely on God, Jesus Christ is our Savior God. Rely on him and you're going to go to heaven. It's impossible for you to work your way to heaven based on, you know, being religious or being a good person. So you need to reject the, the merit system, reject it as a means of salvation. Uh, 
you need to repent. The word repent literally translates to change your mind. Change your mind about getting to heaven through personal merit and striving. Understand that it's impossible. Throw up your hands and surrender and say, I, I, I admit defeat. I can't do it. I need help. I need a savior. Well, guess what? The good news is Jesus is the savior. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He's the way to heaven. He's the truth you need to believe. He's the life everlasting you'll receive. And then he says, and no man comes to the Father except through me. He says, I'm the only way. No other, no religions can get you to heaven. No one can save you but me. Uh, Moses can't save you. The Virgin Mary can't save you. The Pope can't save you. Muhammad can't save you. Buddha can't save you. Only Jesus Christ can save you. And why? Because he is God who became a man and he died for your sins. So your sins are paid for. And he raised himself from the dead, proving all those claims are true. And now he's doing this right now. Look at this icon. He's reaching out to you with his nail pierced hand, picturing that he paid for your sins and says, I'll take you to heaven. Trust me. Just trust me. And if you come to Jesus in faith, saying, believing that, okay, I can't do it. I need you to save me. I'm going to trust you. Then you're guaranteed. You're guaranteed you're going to go to heaven because Jesus said that, uh, uh, when, he, when, he, when he gets a hold of you, he says, I've got you in the palm of my hand and no one can pluck you out. He says, I will never leave you or forsake you. He promises you're going to go to heaven because of your faith in him. That's a promise from God, so you can trust it. So I ask me, Brother Luke, do you think you're going to go to heaven? And why? I don't think I'm going to go to heaven. I'm confident. I'm assured I'm going to go to heaven. I'm guaranteed I'm going to heaven. Not because I'm religious and a good person, no, but because Jesus promised me he'd take me to heaven, and I believe him. Will you put your faith in Jesus now? Please do it. All right, join me nightly for these broadcasts, 7 p.m. Pacific time. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.